Chunk, 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 Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Practical MDO with John Yasa. And today's special guest, Smokey Kitty. He's in my lap helping me out. Today, we're talking about when to use gradient free optimizers. So, this course is really focused on using gradient based optimization. I'll explain why, and I do explain why in many other lessons, but there are some times when you need to use a gradient-free method. I'll outline some of those times here and explain what kind of problems you might be experiencing that necessitate using a gradient-free method. I've broken it down into four main reasons why you would use a gradient-free optimizer. I'll show some examples of problems in each one of these cases and also explain why we could use a gradient-free optimizer instead of a gradient-based one. I won't belabor any of these points yet because I'll go into much more detail later on. This definitely has to do with the optimization subtopic in this course. So before we talk about when you should use gradient-free optimizers, I wanna say you should probably use gradient-based methods. Even if you think, hey, I need to use a gradient-free method here, I don't know, think about using a gradient-based one. And I'm not just saying that because I'm, I'm pretty opinionated here, I'm not just trying to push gradient-based methods onto you, but I'm trying to say that because they're so much more efficient than gradient-free methods. For example, using different starting points and gradient-based methods usually results in a faster optimization process than using just gradient-free methods. Additionally, even if you don't have derivative information for your model, maybe it makes sense to use finite difference or complex step to get an approximation for the derivatives and still use gradient-based methods. But you're watching this because you want to know when to use gradient-free methods. So I will not go into extreme detail about why gradient-based methods are better. There's a different lesson for that. But just know that you should probably walk into a problem thinking you're going to solve it using a gradient-based method. Okay, so the, the first reason why you could use a gradient-free method is if you have a noisy or discontinuous design space. Let me show you an example. I think examples are a great way to learn. Here we have a one-dimensional function f of x, and we have x on the x-axis. Let's say we query the function at one point here, and we see that it's right here. Okay, looks great. Let's, we're looking for the minimum, though. We're trying to optimize it. So let's query it uh, again. Oh, right next to it, it's, it's pretty close. Maybe it's pretty flat there. Um, I'll query it just a, a little bit over, and oh, it's, it's lower. So what does this mean? Maybe I'll, I'll try down here. Oh, this is much lower. So here I'm trying to find the minimum of this function, and the goal is to find the global minimum. The goal is to find the true minimum. However, as we can see, we're only getting bits and pieces of the story. Now, based on the points that we've sampled so far, we're probably saying, okay, the minimum's probably around x equals four is what I'm seeing. but let's get a whole lot more points in there. Let's say that we could query this function across many more different design points. Well, we see, oh my gosh, this function's very noisy. For a given x value, its neighboring point might be wildly different. It might be pretty different on the f of x axis. If you tried to get a gradient-based optimizer going in there, it may get stuck in part of this noise. It may try to do a, a step and then see that the function changes very wildly and then try another step and it, it changes differently. And that could be confusing to a gradient-based optimizer. So in the case when your function is rather noisy, it, it might make sense to use a gradient-free method. You may not find the global mathematical optimum, but you will find an optimum. And you may be able to traverse the noisy design space better using a gradient-free method. Another case when it may make sense to use gradient-free methods is when you have a discontinuous design space. So here we have C0 discontinuities, which means that the actual function is discontinuous. You can see there are some jumps in it for x equals three and x equals four, it changes instantaneously. A gradient-based optimizer would not like this, especially if the optimum is near one of these discontinuities. Now, even if your design space or function is C0 continuous, it might be C1 discontinuous. So here we, we have a, a continuous function, it connects in nice lines, but if you look at x equals three and x equals four, the derivative changes instantaneously. Now for this function, it's not a big deal because that's not where the global minimum is, but in general, you may not know what your function looks like. If you have C1 discontinuities, it may be challenging to use a gradient-based method. In reality, you could change your model to try to make it more smooth and continuous and more apt for gradient-based methods, and that's probably what you should do. But if your physical design space actually has these discontinuities in it, you can't do anything about that. You have to model it the way you need to. Another case where it might make sense to use gradient-free optimizer is in the case of multimodal problems. Now, I want to be very clear here. Gradient-free optimizers do not inherently solve multimodal problems better than gradient-based methods. Often, gradient-based optimizers are local optimizers and that they're looking for a local optimum, which may be the global optimum. And often, gradient-free methods are global optimizers, which means that they're supposed to explore the entire design space. Gradient-free methods are not always global, and gradient-based methods are not always local. So I'm bringing this up because there's often a misconception that says, ah, gradient-free methods will be better 
for global optimization. That's not necessarily the case. All that being said, if we have a multimodal problem, perhaps a gradient-free method will help you traverse it better. Let's say we have this kind of egg crate looking two-dimensional problem here. There are a lot of local optimums. In the four corners, we have some more global optimum, and there's one actual global optimum in the lower left-hand corner. But here, let's start a gradient-based optimizer on it. Oh, okay, we start here, we go into a local optimum. Well, this is great. Maybe we can start in a different point and see where we settle into. Here we start at this point, and we settle into a different local optimum. So when I say that you could use a, a mix of different gradient-based optimizers with different starting points, this is what I mean. You can kind of try different random starting points, maybe a Latin hypercube sampling, and, and see where the gradient-based optimizers converge. Now another option is to use a gradient-free method. Here I will show you the results of a genetic algorithm, which is a gradient-free global optimization method. It operates by having a kind of swarm of points that move around the design space. And based on kind of the evolution of these points and the, the function values at each one of the points, it tries to converge on a solution. Now in this two-dimensional case, it does pretty well. It converges on the global optimum. However, each one of these points represents a function evaluation. If we have a, a population size of 20 and we have maybe 50 generations, that's a, a thousand function calls. You can probably do better with gradient-based optimizers that start at many different design points. That being said, if you want to set up something, hit run and, and just give it a lot of computational time, you can use a gradient-free method here. Now this is a good segue into one of the next cases where you could use a gradient-free optimizer. When you have an extremely cheap model. When you have a computationally cheap model and it just takes fractions of a second to run, maybe you can get away with having thousands or tens of thousands of calls to this function. Maybe that's A-OK. -okay. Here you wouldn't need to worry about setting up your derivatives or using gradient-based methods because the model is so cheap. If your trade-off between developer cost and computational cost is such that it doesn't make sense to spend any developer, your time, working on this, you can just use a gradient-free method with many, many design points and really query the space globally. Again, this only makes sense for very cheap models. I certainly want to do this with, with a lot of physics-based models, let alone CFD or FEA models. It, it makes limited sense to use gradient-free optimizers then. Another case when it makes sense to use gradient-free optimizers is when you cannot compute derivatives. When I say you cannot compute derivatives, maybe I mean that you don't have the developer time, or maybe you can't understand the model, or you don't have access to the source code, but also in the cases of integer programming. There are many actual engineering cases where there's not a continuous design space. For wind turbine design, should you have two, three, or four blades? You can't have three and a half blades on a wind turbine. There are lots of examples where there are natural integer-based problems. And inherently in these integer-based problems, there are discontinuities. There are sort of step functions in the design space. In these cases, when you cannot compute derivatives, maybe it makes sense to use gradient-free optimizers. By choosing a priori, the, the kind of integer-based values, you can also do a series of gradient-based optimizations to find the best designs for these different integer cases. Let's say that we have two blades on the wind turbine, and we try to find the best twist profile using gradient-based optimization. Then we could set, okay, we have three blades. Then we could set, we have four blades, something like that, and say, for each one of these cases, here's what the optimal result looks like. Again, integer-based design spaces crop up all the time in engineering. You can either kind of smooth them out to use continuous gradient-based optimization, you can use gradient-free methods, or you can do a kind of parameter sweep or design of experiments holding fixed some of these integer-based values. One topic that I didn't really delve into but I'd like to mention is that you can also use gradient-free methods to sort of seed gradient-based optimizations. So let's say you let your genetic algorithm converge for maybe 10 iterations, then you have some great starting points for different gradient-based optimizers. Thinking about this kind of bumpy egg crate problem, if we use the genetic algorithm to set some starting points for the gradient-based method, that'd be a great idea. It's a more intelligent way of doing it than just using random seeding, and it gives you some notion of kind of a hybrid-based approach, which looks at the entire global design space and also actually gets to the local optimum. I collaborated on a paper where we used a kind of hybrid gradient-free, gradient-based approach to get the layout for a wind farm. Now, wind turbine layout is inherently a very multimodal problem, but by seeding the gradient-based optimizations with gradient-free results, we're able to explore the design space more efficiently than we could have otherwise. This is just one example of using gradient-free optimizers in conjunction with gradient-based optimizers to your benefit. So this is kind of a hodgepodge of why you should use gradient-free methods, or maybe why you shouldn't, but I hope you enjoyed. If you've liked what you've seen, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. And guys, gals, and non-binary pals, thank you for watching. Bye.